Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us to meet with us during worship, to remind us of who you are, to remind us that, Lord, we need to commit everything to you. And so this morning, Lord, we don't want to neglect the fact that you're here with us. Those of us who have accepted you as our Lord and Savior, Jesus, that you have come to take up residence inside our bodies, that your Holy Spirit has come and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Help us to worship you, Lord, with our whole heart, that we would give you our whole mind and all of our spirit, that we would hear from you today, each one of us experiencing life in a different facet and a slightly different hue. And I pray that you speak to us in only the way that you do, that you might mend those things in our hearts that are broken, that you might rebuild those things that have been torn down, that you might establish your truth inside of us. So Lord, as we look at your word, help us to be loosed from this world and to be tethered to you even more intimately. Guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, kids. We're going to talk about dependence and independence. Dependence and independence. I don't know about you, but um, because we belong to America, America is very strong on independence, on rebellion against authority. Wow, no woo-hoos. Okay. We are a rebellious people. We just are in our hearts, but then also because of our culture. And becoming independent is something that we might boast of. You know, when you leave your parents' house and you establish your own home and there's independence, there's this great sense of worth and accomplishment. And so we have this whole thing about independence. And when it comes to God, we get it wrong. Because we can't be independent from God, can we? Amen. Although sometimes we think we can, and we lean on our own understanding, and, and not in all of our ways do we acknowledge him, and then we don't get directed in our paths, and we wonder why. It's because we don't lean on him. We don't depend on him. We don't ask him for guidance. We just go about our own business and say, well, I, I know what I'm doing here. God, I got this. It's, it's a difficult thing because it's one of those things that our culture just really pats us on the back for. You, you go to your job and you do something, uh, you know, extra in addition to what's expected of you. And the boss says, wow, that's independent thinking. I like that. You, you're going to go places, boy. You know, and you get that sort of a, an encouragement all the time, right? And you think being independent is really where God wants us to be. We can't ever be independent of him. Without being dependent on him, it's a little like trying to start your car without a battery. You might have all the equipment or think that you do, but you don't have the thing that's vital to give the spark that's going to keep the thing running. By God's spirit, we can do that. In our own flesh, we just don't have it. And Jesus is going to bring up some things in this next section. And he's going to talk about independence and dependence. If, uh, if you're familiar with the passage, it's going to be about the rich young ruler once we get to it. Just to go over what we went over last week, we talked about marriage and divorce from Jesus's point of view, the disciples then questioning him afterwards, but the Pharisees coming to him as he taught the people, as he always does, he's in the area of the Decapolis as we're watching the trek of Jesus from the Galilee up into Jerusalem and ultimately going to the cross. We see that they're asked a question. Jesus says, what's said to Jesus is, can a man divorce his wife? And that's a really good question, right? But you always have to watch questions because there's a motive behind the question. And sometimes people ask a question they already have an answer to, or they'll ask a question because they want to tell you something. You don't find that to be the case. Apparently, I'm the only one that goes through that. Uh, so, Pastor Dave. Yeah, I get, I get that a lot. And uh, it's like, okay, you already have an answer and you're either picking a fight with me or you want to see where I stand or you want to prove me wrong and stump the teacher thing, you know, and I get it. That's fun. I like to play all those games. That's fun. <laughs> or maybe people are just really want to know, but we see that the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask him this question with intention. They're trying to stumble him. They're trying to mess him up. And if you're trying to mess up the son of God, you got a problem. 
But there's this giant fight between the, the contemporary teachers of the day, between Hillel and Shimei, and this competition of where, what does the scripture mean when it talks about divorce? Can a man divorce his wife? And we see that it's for almost any reason, according to Hillel, if, if your wife, you know, burns your toast, overseasons your food, if, uh, and, and of course, there's another one that says, if your wife suddenly is less appealing than she once was, and you find someone else who's more attractive, you can trade up like you would a car. And so Hillel is obviously the liberal end of all of this, and Shimei is the, the, the conservative, and he says there's only one reason for divorce, and that's sexual immorality. And so they were trying to pit Jesus against the establishment and trying to exclude people. And you'll always exclude people when you take a stand for truth. Have you noticed that? Some people are more concerned with having peace with everyone and pleasing everyone. And you can't do that if you wish to be a truth teller. If you want to tell the truth, you, you do it in love. And that's the balance, right? You can't ever shrink back on telling the truth because the truth is what we need, right? Yeah. I'm so full of words today. It must be coffee. <laughs> Jesus makes it very plain on what side he sits, other than sexual immorality, which is the violation of the most intimate relationship that you can have on this planet, which is a sexual relationship with the opposite sex, your wife or your husband. To violate that becomes such an issue where trust almost cannot be rebuilt, although it's not a necessary thing for you to get divorced. And I know many people who have survived such devastating things and God has blessed their marriage for it because they put God first afterwards. And yet Jesus having to answer this question, Jesus making it very clear, unless there is adultery, whoever marries this woman who is divorced in this way is committing adultery. And so the traditions of men have stepped in and redefined this and made a mess of it so that there are people all over the place committing adultery because they're not divorced biblically. And so Jesus explains all that. And I, I said last week, I know that I'm probably going to step on some toes, but Jesus wasn't afraid to speak the truth. And so he did. They were probably trying to get him to side with John the Baptist, who took a very strong stance on marriage and informed Herod, hey, it's not right that you have this woman that you call your wife because it's your brother's wife. And what, what he did is upset her and she got her daughter to come and dance seductively. And uh, he, he literally got his head chopped off for that. So he's trying to, they're trying to get Jesus to make enemies. And he answered them and he says, well, what did Moses command you? And so Jesus is going to go all the way back to the beginning. What is the essence of marriage? Let's not talk about divorce. Let's talk about what marriage is, because to understand divorce, you got to understand what marriage is, right? Marriage is not a contract that you sign. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a give and take. It's not, I will do for you as long as you, you don't get that at a wedding. You notice that I will love you as long as you love me and I will serve you as long as you serve me. And the minute you burn my dinner, it's not a transactional contract. A contract is, I will do such and such, you will do so. And if you don't, you are in breach of contract. And if you don't, you're in breach of contract. I wonder how many of you, if you had a contract with your spouse, would be in breach of contract? <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone. Myself included, I'll put myself at the head of the list. Which is why marriage rocks is a good idea. A sudden plug. Jules, there you go. Because, you know, just like a garden, you need to, to weed it, you need to fertilize it, you need to protect it, you need to put sticks in there so the things stand up nice, you need to lift the fruit up off the ground so it doesn't die. All of those things you have to do for a garden, how much more a marriage? And so marriage takes work. And Jesus says, well, what is this institution of marriage? It's a covenant of one man and one woman for life before God. That's what it is. To turn it into anything else is to be unbiblical. Amen. And we're all in breach of contract. But that's why there's forgiveness, right? Yes. 
So Jesus goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and 22. And we looked at that. We looked at all of the passages which talk about divorce. So you guys have a good broad base of understanding as to what the scripture teaches. And it's a, it's a very involved thing. Um, and of course, the one that's in Exodus chapter 21 is a very peculiar one. Unless you have bought your wife as a slave in your home, uh, it really doesn't apply to anybody here. Uh, and even if you're uh, Jewish, it doesn't apply. So Jesus answering them, he says, the reason that Moses said this was because of the hardness of your heart, which tells me divorce is for the hardness of people's hearts. Amen. You guys know that's true, right? Amen. It's because there's a hardness that occurs in the heart where you just will not be forgiving anymore. And you will not honor the words that you said as a covenant before God. And you get bitter in your heart and you say, no, I'm done with you. I could have said that a bunch of times. My wife could have said that a bunch of times. Jesus could have said that to me a bunch of times. But God is faithful. God is faithful. And I'm glad for that. So we went over this last week and about how it's a three-legged race. In a marriage, it's a three-legged race. And Jesus says that which God has joined, by the way, a marriage is not uh, an officiant marrying people or the government marrying people. It is God who makes the binding contract or the covenant, and it's the rest of the world that then recognizes it. So Jesus says, don't mess with it, because marriage is about wholeness. If you remember, men, it says God created Adam in his image, comma. In his image, he created them, male and female, he created them, which means there's something of male and female that's the image of God in completeness. Not just man in and of himself, where some people would tell you, no, it's the man in and of himself. What happened when God came and made man from dirt, but made woman from his side? Men, we're not all there. Would you agree? <laughs> Ladies, would you agree? Yeah. Oh, of course you would. And you're right. And so there's this completeness that comes with male and female. Now, not everyone is called to get married. It is the exception, however, if you're called to be single. So know that if you're going to get married, it's pretty much the norm, regardless of what the society says. Did you know that in recent years, divorce has gone down? Because people don't get married, they just live together. Just in case you saw the numbers and say, Pastor, you know, marriage has gone down. Well, that's true, but it's also gone way, way down, people who get married, because they see failures in their own families. They see the devastation it causes, and they go, I want nothing to do with that. So I'll just live with you forever, except if one spouse has to go to the hospital or one dies, it, you have all sorts of complications because there's no paperwork. And then you get family members that close in like buzzards, and they start picking at your... At, at, at all of your leavings, and it's a just, it's a dreadful mess. And then you're always wondering if that person is going to leave you because they wouldn't commit to a lifetime commitment. So you're always wondering, hmm, I wonder when they're going to leave because they, they've already got one foot out the door. Or a, you make a contract premaritally with somebody you're going to get married to, a prenuptial agreement. That's called a premature exit. That's what that is. I want to protect all my stuff because my stuff is my stuff, and I never want it to be your stuff. Well, that violates one of the laws of marriage, doesn't it? Because everything is ours. Jesus reiterated from Genesis, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. Interesting, Adam and Eve didn't have parents to leave. Why would God say this at the very first marriage? Because it's an enduring principle. It's not something he told them only. It's something that endures to us. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. There's a new paradigm, a new family, a new authority structure, and cleave into his wife. Gentlemen, it is the responsibility of the man to cleave to his wife. It means, doggone it, you better get in touch with your romantic side <laughs> and show a little concern and love, even though your heart is hard and you'll go into battle, stab a man in the face and keep moving. I know that. But you can't treat your wife that way. You need to show love. Don't be like the guy that tells his wife, listen, I told you 40 years ago at the altar, I love you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> you can't be that way. You've got to demonstrate that 
all the time. You know why? Because the tape in a lot of women's minds tends to erase very quickly. Have you noticed? Well, apparently Rita's doesn't. She knows that her husband loves her and he never needs to tell her. She never needs that security. She never needs to be reminded. Uh, she's got it indelibly etched in her mind. Only every day. And that's a good thing. It's only every day. I find I have to remind my wife all the time, and there are some times I need to remind her more often than others. But more than that, I need to demonstrate that. And so I have found on a weekly basis I take my wife on a date. Yeah, you think it's good. <laughs> that's the only time we can fight sometimes. And you make time to go through that stuff. You make time to digest life. You, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I bought a new car. <laughs> what? You know, and then you have an argument on date night. That's what date night's for. It's a time when you can exclusively spend time on your relationship and not be distracted by, oh, who's texting me? What's going on on Instagram? What's happening on Facebook? Oh my goodness, it's so-and-so's birthday. Did you know that? But you got to get rid of that thing. And if you want to foster relationships, you got to say no to things, right? I'm just saying. See, that's a good way to say something that's delicate and then just say, I'm saying, I'm just saying. And it's like, oh, okay, nothing personal. What do you mean? Everything's personal. Anyway, sorry. Leave, cleave, and the two shall become one flesh. It is not just about the physical union. It is about everything of hers is mine and everything that's mine is hers. All of the good, the bad, and the ugly of my life is now my wife's. <laughs> and all the good, the bad, and the ugly, including the debt, including her family, <laughs> including perhaps previous children from a previous relationship who are living under my roof. Everything that's hers is mine, and everything that's mine is hers. That's what marriage is. And you, gotta, you better know what you're doing when you step into that pool, right? That pit of alligators. <laughs> Because when I, when I married my wife, um, I don't think I had any debt, but we do now. <laughs> and she married into my family, which, you know, I pray for her. Because my family is a shattered, a shattered, shattered thing. Now, her family is twisted in a completely different direction. And I now had a father-in-law and a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law and a brother-in-law, and uh, all of these people that now are added to my life, and like it or not, they're family. The two shall become one flesh. Everything that's yours is mine, everything that's mine is yours, including all of your past, including all of my wife's past boyfriends, <laughs> including all of my past girlfriends, all the experiences that we go through, we now mush it into one, like blue and red, you know, Play-Doh and we make purple. And we're always in the midst of becoming one flesh. And by the way, in the original uh, Hebrew, it's in a perpetual state. It's not, it's a one-time event. It's perpetually, we're always becoming one flesh, which means there's always movement in that direction. And the fourth thing Jesus didn't mention in this passage is that they were both naked and unashamed, which means they were completely open and honest. There's no hidden life. There's no secret life here, a little secret there. There's no secrets. You're completely open and honest about everything. There's no hiding anything. Even the most sensitive things in your life are now open to your mate. And that takes a great deal of trust, doesn't it? Amen. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't get naked in front of everybody. <laughs> in a spiritual sense. In a physical sense, too. Uh, but, you know, there's short list. Doctors... And my wife. That's, that's it. That's the list. <laughs> Marriage is God joining people together, and we are spectators and witnesses, and we're warned not to tamper with God's work. Jesus said, that which God has joined, don't let man put us under. Don't let man cut up and split what God has joined. Amen. So we need to understand marriages of God. It's not just a social thing. It's not a... It's not that at all. So this week, we're going to finish this passage. Jesus continuing in verse 10, he says, In the house, the disciples also asked him again about the same matter, meaning divorce. And so he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. 
So Jesus said, God doesn't see as man does. And even though man might declare a divorce based on irreconcilable differences, by the way, all differences are reconcilable. Except for one, Jesus said, which is an exception. So you have to make sure that you're, you, you understand that. In Matthew 19, 9 to 11, we have a parallel passage. And I say to you, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. You get the idea that maybe the disciples didn't have a great, meaningful relationship with their wives? You mean it's forever? <laughs> it's better that you don't get married. That's what they're saying. You can hear the panic in it, I think. But he said to them, all cannot accept the saying, but only the those to whom it is given. So marriage is something that's given to people. It's a gift, just like children are a gift. Just like singleness is a gift. It's not something you take upon yourself. It's something that you fulfill a role that God has created you for. So, Jesus, if you're telling me that you can't divorce your wife except for sexual morality, it's better that we don't get married. Yeah, well, it, you know, if you could accept that, yeah. But that's not for everybody. The single life is not for everybody. The whole being married and not being intimate is absolute torture. Because there are... There are needs that a man has, needs that a woman has. And if you're not fulfilling those needs, then you're not fulfilling God's role in your life. And their role is not being met in you. So you're going to walk around partially hollow. Jesus can mend that. Jesus can fill those places. But my goodness, it's so much easier when you do it the way God would have it be. And it's a lot of work otherwise. So my, my condolences to any of you that have been through a relationship in a divorce or been part of a divorced family, which is most of us, by the way. If 50% of the marriages end in divorce, and then you also have children of those parents. I, I come from a divorced family, and it sent me out into the street. I don't, I don't blame them for that. I blame me. Those were my choices. But uh, there definitely was an influence there. So after the disciples were absolutely amazed, there's also another situation that Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. You see, in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, if you guys want to look at it, it talks about divorce when you have a believer, somebody who's committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and somebody who hasn't. And if the person who hasn't, when you finally come to Jesus and your life changes and they go, you know, I don't think I signed up for this. Jesus said, if the unbeliever wants to go, or I'm sorry, Paul said, if the unbeliever wants to go, let him go. But don't force the thing. Don't you get a divorce. If they're willing to live with you, if they're willing to conduct marriage with you, then stay married. And so we should. You made a commitment, you stick to it until somebody else breaks it. And so just so that you know, there's that exit for somebody who has an unbelieving spouse. And at that point, it says, let them go. So that is concluding up to verse 9, which I thought we were going to get done last week. This week, I have even less hope. <laughs> In Mark 10, 21, it says, and then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross, and follow me. And Jesus was saying this to the one, as we know, as the rich young ruler. Matthew takes note that he's rich. Luke takes note that he was a ruler, and we know that he's young. So all of, all of the passages together tell us he's a rich young ruler, um, just so that you understand. And I, I thought he drove a BMW, so I put that picture up. Jesus first is going to talk about children, as he's done previously. Actually, last chapter, we talked about children. Why cannot I work this little thing? And then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them, and Jesus saw it. He was greatly displeased, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them. 
for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Jesus has a special heart for children, and we've seen this previously, and he uses them as an example as to how adults should be. How interesting is that? Usually you have to be an adult to be an example of how a kid should be. Jesus reverses it and says, you guys should be like little children. And he continues on. Now, I can imagine all these little children coming at him, uh, like the, the kids from Peter Pan, you know, who didn't want to grow up and you know, they turned into, you know, wild children. And, uh, but I don't think that was the case. And the disciples, of course, are like bodyguards. You know, stay away, stay away from the teacher. The great teacher doesn't have time for your little child. Isn't, isn't that funny that the disciples of Jesus would prevent women and children from coming to Jesus? I hope that's not the case for any of us. But they were like, you know, don't bother the teacher. He's, he's very busy. You can't, can't be picking up your kids and saying hello and kissing them and praying over them. You know, cut that out. Really? And Jesus wasn't happy about this. That's not their job. They were these self-appointed bouncers for Jesus. And Jesus saw this happen. He's like, you know, you need to cut this out. Don't forbid them. It's this mentality of we four and no more, you know, uh, it's, it's us, right? We don't let new people in. You, you guys, you guys know what it's like to not let new people into your little circle? Shame on you. New people. It's, it's one of those things that your heart should go after is people that you don't know. I, I go after people I don't know and I, I want to know their name and then I forget about it. So it, it's hard for me to do, but. I really do want to get to know new people. I really want new people. Uh, a couple of really good people are Hassan and Janine, who are now uh, new people in uh, our lives. And I'm, I'm glad to get to know you guys. You're definitely top quality people. But there are lots of other people that I'm getting to know, and, I, and sometimes I remember their names. <laughs> we should welcome that. And it shouldn't be something that we shy away from. Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Jesus was very physical in showing attention and affection towards these children, took them into his arms. His, imagine Jesus wrapping his arms around you. This is a very huggy church. For those, for those of you watching, this is a very huggy church. You don't know that. But we're very huggy. And that whole COVID-19 really put a crimp in that. Pfft. We're going to show love. Amen? Amen. We're going to show love. I got, I got COVID three times from you people. <laughs> and now I'm invincible. <laughs> Psalm 127, 3 to 5 says, Behold, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So the children in one's youth. Children are a claim to be a gift from God. They're not a nuisance. They're not, you know, they're, they're better to be not seen and not heard. You know, it's, that's not the case with children. They're a blessing from God. In fact, all you have to do is ask the Goffinettes, because they have a little one now and they can hardly get the heck out of this building because trying to leave with a little baby, everybody's like, hello. <laughs> Hi, oh, look how cute. Yeah, and it's like, you know, we've been here for three hours. Isn't that enough? You know, do you have to greet every single person that goes by? So little Simon's like, there's like a, Wherever they go, there's like an entourage around them, you know, because there's a little child there. That's the heart of Jesus, by the way. The disciples, however, didn't want to bother Jesus with all of those little things, which we call children. And Jesus loved children. And he says, unless you're like these kids, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, I don't think he means, you know, that, you, you know, you soil yourself or, you know, you fall down a lot. You know, I don't, th I think he means to have a simple mind to realize that without Jesus, you're helpless. 
I think it means that you're vulnerable, you're dependent, that you're trusting, that you have no rank, you know, you don't own anything. There's, there's nothing that you set yourself up over other people like adults do all the time. You know, how long you been a Christian? 27 years. <laughs> you know, children don't do that. Little children don't do that. We learn that and we get competitive and we like to think we got something over on somebody else. Oh, I noticed you have a Band-Aid. Yeah, I got cut here. Oh, yeah, let me tell you about I'm missing a foot. You know, <laughs> like we always have to one up each other. That's the flesh. That is not a Christ-like attitude at all. That's wanting to be noticed. That's wanting to be seen, wanting to be praised, wanting to be thought well of. And all of our intentions do the opposite, right? Because the more you talk about yourself, the more people will just turn around and go, Bye. <laughs> and I'm sure you've had people that are that one-way relationship where it's all about them and they don't know anything about you. Hey, hi, how are you? I'm Pastor Dave. Let me tell you all about me. <laughs> hey, we'll see you later. <laughs> Ew, how disgusting would that be? Because relationships should be two ways, right? It's a little like playing tennis with nobody on the other side. It's silly, and it's selfish, and you will absolutely drive people away from you and wonder why you're so lonely. It will exacerbate that whole mentality where you want to be seen, you want to be known, you want to be appreciated, and, and you look for it, and you starve yourself for it because you force everyone away trying to grab it and manipulate it and squeeze it out of people like they were a tube of toothpaste. Why are we not content in Christ? Why do we not have an idea of who we are in him? And that's really the solution, isn't it? Yeah. So Jesus said, if you're like these little children, and he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung about his neck and he were thrown in the sea. That is the zeal of our God and his love toward those who are Dependent, sensitive, th you know, not thinking of their rank or their possessions or any of that. Jesus protects them. And I want to encourage you to take a baby bottle today. We have baby bottles out there. We fill them up with a check or cash or change, and we're bringing them back on Father's Day to help people to not abort their babies. And so I just want to encourage you while we're thinking about that. Jesus loves children in vitro, in, in the womb. Jesus then is going to meet the rich young ruler. Verse 17, now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Well, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So that is the context of the rich young ruler and Jesus's interaction with him. I always picture a guy with a BMW. I don't know why. <laughs> but he runs up to Jesus. So he's, he's definitely motivated, right? He's excited to come to Jesus. And he gets on his knees, a sign of humility. And he's saying, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, don't you think that's a good question? Isn't it a good question to ask other people? 
say, hey, do you know where you're going when you die? That's a really good question to ask people because most people have no clue. And so he is saying, what must I do? You know, you learn much more from people's questions than you do about when you answer them. He's asking, what do I do? You mean there's something to do? Because a, mo a modern conception of how you get to heaven is you've got to do a bunch of good things, right? You've got to be a good person. And by the way, you can't be a good person. Jesus said so. He said, there's only one who's good. So he, this guy says, what do I have to do? And he goes, you can never be good enough. Only one's good enough. That's God. So he's already trying to exhume a question out of this young man that he's, he's not realizing the question is flawed. You know, honey, do these pants make my butt look big? <laughs> it's, it's not a good question because there's no good answer. <laughs> and people try to trap Jesus all the time with that. If you're a Hindu, it's a matter of completely divesting yourself of any emotion whatsoever having no desire. That's the point of Hinduism, eliminating desire, sexual desire, hunger, even the desire to stop pain. That's why some of them pour gas on themselves and set themselves on fire because they are devoid of their emotions. They die to their emotions. And what you do is you climb the ladder to nirvana where you become one with the universe. You know, like Gandhi said at Burger King, make me one with everything. <laughs> In the Muslim faith, there are five things that you have to do, one of which is going to Mecca, the other is giving alms. You have to read the Quran only in Arabic, or you're reading a flawed translation. You know, so there's all of, all of these things that you have to do. Um, there are even Christian religions who say, you got to do this and this and this and this and this. And so this young man coming to Jesus says, what must I do? Well, you know. Just do everything. But Jesus doesn't say that. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Would you be able to tell somebody how they might have eternal life? It's a, it seems to be a simple question. It'd be something that, that you don't need a pastor for. If you read the Bible, it's very clear. Number one, Ezekiel 19.20 says, the soul who sins shall die. People are sinners. And everybody's going to die. You know that? You and me and everybody else, all because of Adam and Eve and, and their falling. They now pass on genetically death. And because the soul that sins must die, everyone's going to die. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The scripture paints a pretty bleak picture of human beings. We're not good, basically. People will tell you people are good, basically. Oh, yeah? Put them on an island with no food and water. They'll kill each other and eat one another, like animals. People are not basically good. The first thing your kid's going to learn, mine. It's the first thing. Oh, they're so naturally giving and thoughtful of others. No, they're not. <laughs> and the reason they're little is so they don't kill you. <laughs> if you had a two-year-old as big as you, you'd be dead. <laughs> First time you don't do what they want. <laughs> That's it. You're done. People are sinners, every one of us, and we're all unprofitable. And the stuff that we have to give out of our heart is contaminated. Everything is. Romans 3, 23 to 24 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many people? All. all. And by the way, it means all in the Greek. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know how you get eternal life? It has nothing to do with what you do. It's who you know. It's about a relationship, not an activity. Amen? Amen. But that relationship creates activity, doesn't it? Because when you love somebody, you don't want to hurt them. When you fall in love with Jesus, trust me, he'll give you a new heart, he'll give you a new life, and he'll have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you will be changed. 
not a, not a caterpillar any longer. Isaiah 53, 6 says, we all like sheep have, sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You understand it's not about us paying for our sins by being good enough because you can't. You know, the celestial scales of, well, if you do more good things than you do bad things, then you'll go to heaven. And if you do more bad things than good, have, than good things, then you're going to go to hell. Then you're going to die. Well, I got news for you. There's nothing to do on the hell side. There's no scales. There's no, the, the standard is perfection, and we all fall short of perfection. If God let you in, in your current state into heaven, you would ruin the whole neighborhood. You know that, right? I know it about myself, so it must be true of you. In Psalm 9, verse 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The scripture says that there will be a day of reckoning where we stand before God and have to give an account of the things that we've done in the body. Every one of us. And you know this is true. And before I was a Christian, I knew that was true. I knew there had to be justice somewhere on the other side because it certainly isn't here, right? Matthew 10, 28, and, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, we tend to be worried about other people and what they think, and we don't really concern ourselves with God as unbelievers. We don't think about what God wants for my life. We don't think that he has a right to us because he created us for a particular purpose. We just go about and say, well, I'm going to have as much fun as I can while I can, and I'll burn out early and leave a pretty corpse. <laughs> that was my philosophy before I knew Jesus. But now I realize that I'm, I'm here for him. We're here for him. Amen? Amen. In Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. In other words, what we earn because we're sinners is death, and we deserve it. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There again, it's not what you do, it's who you know. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. Not by doing a bunch of really good works, right? To outweigh your bad works. And this, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You realize if, if my good things outweigh my bad things, I'm going to go before God and say, yeah, I got a, I got a golden ticket. You got to let me in. I did more good work. Do you think God's going to put up with that? No, there's nobody that can boast before him of anything. This is a free gift that he offers. And he says, I sent my son to take your place. And it's by having faith in the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross that gets us eternal life. Amen. Amen. It's not by what you do. And so this guy says, hey, what do I have to do to enter eternal life? Wrong question. Who do I have to know? And Jesus turns it around. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good. Who's God? I'm sorry. Do you recognize who I am? Or do you not know that only one is good? Only God is good. You see, in his question, he's saying he, he can be good enough to go to heaven and nobody can. Only God's grace through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross gets us into eternal life. Amen? Amen. I just want to make sure that they were solid on that. In John 11, 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, this would be uh, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes. Jesus is asking, do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. It's not do these good things and you will have the resurrection. It's by having faith in Jesus and giving our lives to him and accepting his sacrifice on the cross that gives us eternal life. And so the question he asks is an errant question. In Acts 2, verses 37 to 39, Stephen, I'm sorry, Peter, speaking in front of all the people at Pentecost, says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, 
men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice the question about what do we do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Jesus said, repent, which is turn around and give your life to Jesus Christ. Be baptized, which means I identify with the death of Jesus Christ as I go down and with his resurrection as I come up, which means you have given yourself over unto death so that Jesus might live in you through the resurrection of you coming up out of the water. By the way, we're planning a baptism soon. So those of you who have not gone under in faith into the waters of baptism and trusted a pastor not to drown you, you will have the opportunity coming soon. And so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? But one is good. There's one that is God. And then he raffles off some commandments. He says, you know the commandments. And he tells him six of them. These are off the second tablet of the law, which is about how we treat one another. It's a good thing he didn't start with the last one or the first one, because those to me seem a bit harder. You know, if you're going to love God with everything that you have, or make sure that you don't have any desires, <laughs> make sure you don't desire anything that's your neighbor's, those, those seem to be pretty tough. Because, you know, there's a lot of things I want, you know. Anyway, so he gives them some easy ones. And he says, well, I've, he says, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I've done this since I was a child. Do you know anyone who has been constantly always good to their mother and father and honored them? No, no because they're children. Mine, you know. <laughs> Jesus doesn't argue with him. He says, I've done all these since I was a youth. You know, bing, a little halo over his head. Is there, is there anything else? Because these are easy. I've never stolen. I've never defrauded. I've never lied. I've never, well, Jesus gave him all the good ones. He says, well, if you want to do stuff, you know the law. And he just gives him a handful. He didn't even go deep. Because Jesus wishes to say something in which we will benefit from. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Amen. I want you to notice his motive. Right. Here's a guy who thinks he's good enough. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross. Now, this is before he went to the cross. And follow me. And he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let me ask you a question here, Bible students. Does Jesus ask all of us to do that? So we should live in poverty, sell all our possessions, and give them to the poor, and come and follow Jesus and take up the cross and follow him. Yes. When you accept Jesus Christ, don't you give up your rights to everything? Amen. Jesus says in another place in Luke 14, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus was asking him to do the same thing he asks of us, to give everything to him. If you haven't given everything to him, I would exhort you to do so. You know, Lord, I'll give you everything except for this. You know, my, my three-week vacation at, at a heathen resort. You know, I can't give you that, Lord. Or I'll give you everything except for my kid. You know, you can't have my kid because I don't, I, I love my kid more than you. That sounds funny when I say that. You know, I'll, I'll give you everything, Lord, but I, I, I you know, I got to have this, you know, my Friday night. I got to have that. I got to blow my steam off somehow. 
You see, Jesus said, if, if you're keeping anything back, you're not worthy to be my disciple. In fact, in comparison to your love for God, you should hate your parents. In other words, you prefer them less on the list of priorities. Jesus asks us to do the same thing that he's asking this young man to do, is give up everything. I think he's asking him to do something literal that he is unwilling to do. And Jesus is pointing out, your stuff means way too much to you. It's just the one thing that you need to do, give up everything. Oh, that all? Just that one thing, huh? Give up everything. Yeah, and he asked the same of us. Have you given him everything? I'm, I can tell you, I, I think I have, and then I'm in the process of doing it too. Because I shouldn't weigh 225 pounds. But I don't weigh 265 pounds anymore. So I'm in process. God help me. I'm still a fat old man. <laughs> and if anything happens, it's by God's grace anyway. But Jesus says, we're all to do this. And he touched on something because he had great possessions. Well, he didn't really have great possessions. The possessions had him. And Jesus looked around at his disciples and he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. By the way, any of you have riches? Oh, yes, you do. If you're here, you, you got here by transportation. That's a privilege. Do you have health? It's a privilege. Do you have a home? It's a privilege. Do you have shoes? Some of you have flip-flops, but you know. It's a privilege. You all have food? There's nobody dying here. That's a privilege. We are rich. We're a wealthy, spoiled nation. You want to argue about that later, we can talk. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. That means you and I as well. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. I want you to mark that. It's not just being rich. It's the riches having you. Who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There was an old proverb which said, it's hyperbole, by the way, it's easier for an elephant to go through the eye of a needle than for fill in the blank. And so Jesus is taking this and he's taking the largest animal which is found in Jerusalem, which is a camel, and saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Now, there's this wonderful tradition that you might know about. In the walls of Jerusalem, it is said that there is a gate called the Eye of the Needle. It's a small gate. In fact, there's one pictured here. And the only way a camel can actually thread that thing is if he's on his knees and he has to take all of his possessions off his back. And that's all wonderful, except there's no such gate. I just want you to know that. There are people that strive to, you know, put it up on Snopes if you have to. <laughs> there are things that people will talk about, and there are tour guides that will take you through Jerusalem and tell you stuff and weave a wonderful tale. And I love the parable of it, but Jesus was using hyperbole. Hyperbole is exaggeration. Jesus exaggerated? Yes, it's exaggeration to make a point. Paul does the same thing. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels... And I have not love, I'm a resounding gong and a clang, clanging cymbal. He, go, he goes on to be, you know, if I know all mysteries and all knowledge and I can move mountains, if I can do all this stuff and I have not love, it profits me nothing. So he's using hyperbole as well. He's going to the nth degree of a particular quality. If I give my body to be burned, it profits me nothing if I have not love. It's hyperbole to make a point. Let's say you had this thing to the nth degree. What good is it if you don't have love? It's a bunch of showing off is what it is, right? So Jesus is saying it'd be better for a camel. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which there's a lot of blending and filtering involved. Um, so it's hyperbole. First Timothy 6, 6 to 10 says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's a good word for the church today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Contentment. What does that mean? What God has given me is enough. And even if I don't think it's enough, I'm going to be content because God's got a plan in it. So if you're married and you say, God, help me, be content. If you're single and you say, God, please, I need somebody, be content. Whatever it is, be content in the situation in which God has you and be a good, faithful steward of what you have. That's what God calls us to do. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Do you see the disciples are a little overwhelmed by Jesus' teaching? First of all, if you get married and you can't get divorced, what the heck is that about? It's better not to get married. Jesus is like, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, if you can't handle it, then, then you shouldn't do that. And here he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which is impossible. He says, then who can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, because they had the idea that if you had riches, they were a gift from God, which they are. And yet, it's not because you deserve them or because God finds favor with you, you might just be putting all the right principles into effect. Like you wake up early, you go to bed late, like you're putting in the work. Hey, that has its own reward, doesn't it? And God will bless that because those are all in accordance to what he's created you to be. But it doesn't mean that God is pleased with you because you're rich. I mean, you, you're telling me that Bezos and, you know, God's pleased with all these people. Apple computer, God's happy with those folks. You're telling me that God morally approves of their lifestyle and right? Bill Gates and all these people, all the people in Congress who are rich, God approves of all them. Is that right? And he says, with men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. You know, God can save the worst sinner. He can save somebody who is so incredibly educated that they don't think they need God, like a Jordan Peterson. And yet God is speaking to that man's heart. Amen. Pray for him. Somebody like Elon Musk, who is a genius and who's wealthy out of his mind, and yet his personal life is a disaster because he doesn't know Jesus. Pray for him. Because with men, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter began to say to him, see... We have left all to follow you. Jesus, on the, on the coattails of the rich young ruler, Peter comes, and he doesn't want to be forgotten by Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we did that. What you're asking him to do, we, we did that. Ooh, ooh, I did that. Now, I know I'm making fun of Peter, and he's going to give it to me when I meet him, but I think I have a reason. Proverbs 27.2 says, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips, which makes it very difficult to fill out a resume. <laughs> Peter's a bit of a peacock. <sighs> <laughs> what about me, Jesus? Look at us. We've done that. We've left everything. What do you say about that? Proverbs 17.28, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Sometimes what you should say is nothing. In Matthew 6, 1 to 6, Jesus says this, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. I, I can see him looking at Peter. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. 
that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I want you to notice the repeated word, secret. People, we are secret keepers. We're secret keepers about our relationship with God and all the things we do for Him. I'm not going to be a secret about how cool you guys are. I think that's the way it should be. If you're going to pat any on a, anyone on the back, don't let it be you. Let it be someone else. You can get your back in a terrible twist. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands and persecutions with persecutions. By the way, that's part of the contract. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And I think that was directly aimed at Peter. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. But I say, brethren... The time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as those who did not rejoice, and buy, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. How many of you are confused? <laughs> none of you. That's great. Well, like the prophet Joel says, I go to extremes. <laughs> Jesus is saying, don't hold so tightly to the things in this world that Jesus becomes secondary. If you can't put everything on the line and say, Lord, I'm, uh, everything is yours. And you see, that's what Jesus is driving at. Everything is yours. My life is yours. You do whatever you want me to do. You say jump, I'll say how high. That's the way we should be. And I know we went a little long today. I want to thank you guys for hanging in there and not falling asleep. Next week, we're going to see Jesus is going to talk about blindness and sight and what the essence of sight and blindness really is. I'm going to ask you